Well, thank you for those who join us tonight and down the road, those who are reviewing the recording of tonight's presentation. Um, we are here at the Conan High School Jack Ridge Middle School Administration for our third parent forum of this summer time frame. In this forum talking specifically about teaching, learning, and grading practices and the continued evolution of those practices in support of student learning. We'll start with going through sort of some background and context and then focus on the specific adjustments that will be happening this school year um, as we seek to continue down the road of better and more accurately um, capturing student progress. Come on in. No, no problem. You can sit here, you can sit wherever you're comfortable. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Next slide. So just a value statement to start things off. You know, we want to emphasize that as a district and as a middle high school, um, I think you just have to click again. There's some that have animations built into them. We, what we value most is that the way that we grade, assess, and report learning, that that is a system that's fair to learners and ensures that they're getting consistency as much as possible from one um, area to the next, and that that grading and reporting is accurate, and that what parents, guardians, and learners, and future teachers see is an accurate reflection of the skills and knowledge that the learner has demonstrated in the course. So just an example, oops, something happened there, you don't have to click. Again, whoops. Yep, oh, one more time. Okay, so if you have two math classes, math teacher one, math teacher two, teaching the exact same course, and this is in a traditional system, and teacher one sets up their grade book such that homeworks count for 25% of the grade, teacher two in the exact same course sets it up so that homeworks count as 30% of the grade, Teacher one has a philosophy in their classroom that allows retakes, uh, sorry, does not allow retakes of tests and quizzes. The grade you get the first time is the grade you're stuck with. Whereas teacher two might allow one retake for assessment. Teacher three believes that everything should be graded and weighted um, to, to make sure that there's, from that teacher's uh, philosophy, a consequence for the actions that the learner does. Whereas math teacher two says, you know what? I think everybody has a couple bad days per quarter. So I'm gonna drop your three lowest grades. Teacher one says no extra credit for you. What you get is what you get. Teacher two likes to do some riddles and things like that and throws those onto tests. And so that becomes some extra credit points. So same exact class, two learners, each taking it with a different teacher will definitely in this scenario end up with a different grade, even if their skill sets look the same. Is that sort of a system fair? We don't believe it is. And our, our process for change has focused on, again, getting to a place where fair, fairness is built into our systems for grading. Another thought. Oh boy. Okay, so that, there you go, some color on those. So another thought, if you have for a learner, a classroom grade, the standardized assessment that the state gives, the New Hampshire SAS, as well as another data point that we use for this eighth grade learner, which would be the PSAT-8, each of these will yield something for the learner. So let's just say in this example, the learner has earned a classroom grade of an F. Now this could be because of how the points accumulate, this could be because the work that's taking place in the classroom is something that the learner doesn't grasp or doesn't think is important. But the same learner scores a New Hampshire SAS score of a three, which is proficient in all areas, and a PSAT eight score of meeting the benchmark for all areas, that learner's grade, which is a failure, is what would carry forward, not anything else, even though two data points are showing that the learner has achieved the skills or knowledge that is required for that, that grade level in that course. Is this grade of an F accurate in that scenario? The answer is obviously no, because two other data points, which are normed and standardized, have shown the learner is in really good shape. Now, this is not, neither of these scenarios are outlandish. These are real scenarios that have been pulled from the last several years of and, and beyond. Um, we often in the summertime on this example here, we'll get emails and phone calls because parents of course get all their standardized assessment scores with the last report card of the school year. And a, a lot of times we do get this exact question, often on the other end, why is my child getting an A in the class, but showing a one or a two or not meeting benchmarks here, there's a disconnect. 
And sometimes we get scenarios like this, well, my child failed three classes and yet on the SAS or on the SAT, they're scoring extremely high and showing that they have met all of the goals for learning. That's a disconnect in accuracy, again, between what we're reporting in the classroom but, and versus what skills and knowledge are being captured on different types of assessments. Another way of thinking of our journey, um, traditional grading systems, the zero to 100 that's been in place for the last maybe 60 or 70 years, the things that it tends to value or capture more of is a system where points become important. You chase points. How can I get back two points? How can I get extra credit to increase my points? It values the systems around that. So again, navigating the percentage of what this assignment is worth versus another one. And it tends to value positive work habits, which are important, but again, timeliness of assignments, your ability to go to, with the teacher and do some of those extra pieces, that tends to earn more of those points in a traditional grade system, even if the skills or knowledge underlying that are not really as strong. What tends to be missing in this system? Capturing the performance and of skills and the actual content that's being learned. That's harder to capture when you have an average-based system and what progress may have been shown by the end of a course. In a traditional system, a learner who might have struggled, especially in the transition to middle or high school early in the year, they might start off the year with very low grades in a particular skill or content area, and by the end of the year have mastered that at a very high level of learning. In a traditional system where it's about points and averages, that learner's grade is still going to be quite low, even though by the end of the course, they might have mastered all or most of the material and done very well. So far as a school, we have made some changes towards that fair and accurate sort of model that we're looking at. The first thing we've did that is, is ongoing and will not change is the separation of habits of work out of academic grading. This second sort of piece that we put in place was assigning zero weight to practice or pre-assessment types of material. We call them formatives, but it's really just assessments that are designed for the teacher to know more about where the learners are at. And the third thing we've already put in place in prior years is a concrete retake policy, <clears throat> excuse me. So this, the work habits piece was a 2018-19 school year change. This required us to have our teachers um, report work habits separately, which have already been done on a one to four scale since the 2018-19 school year. And this removed the weight for those from academic grades. So for example, late assignments prior to 2018-19 often carried a penalty on the grade, which meant even if the learner showed high levels of achievement on an assessment, if it was turned in late, their grade was docked, which lowered how accurately we were reporting their actual growth. We've now removed that. That late assignment still carries weight, but is now reported as a timeliness work habit issue versus impacting the measurement of skills or knowledge. In the 1920 school year, when we made the adjustment to formative assessment, this allowed learners to make mistakes to have opportunities to practice in a safe environment that wasn't impactful to their grade and to receive feedback early in the learning process. Again, this allows those actual academic grades to be more fair in the sense that weighting doesn't matter between one assignment to the next and also more accurate because that grade only should capture now what is actually being measured for skills and knowledge after the learning has taken place. And in the 2021 school year, piggybacking with a lot of COVID pieces, we emphasize and put in place more rigorous opportunities for retakes of assessments with zero penalty. And that wasn't designed to make it easy for learners to improve their grade. It was designed to recognize, again, that the goal is to capture actual learning and actual progress. And if a learner has grown, learned more, and achieved more a few weeks after an assessment, we want them to have the opportunity to show that learning and have it captured and reflected in their grade. So we have done work to make grades more fair and accurate to a degree. What we're sharing tonight is just the continuation of that journey. For this upcoming school year, we're focusing primarily on the tightening of the accuracy of our grades. So just a couple of things that, to think about as we look at this. What is the difference in a traditional system between an 80, which is a B range, and a 79, which is a C range? That one point difference doesn't mean anything. How can we tighten that down to better reflect the difference in skill or knowledge between those two ranges? As a parent, what do you know about the particular skill or knowledge that might be missing if all you see is a 77, which is a large number smacked onto an assessment? 
And how can we shift from a learner mindset where they might approach a teacher and say, what can I do to bring my grade up, which is not reflective of what they're recognizing as the need for more learning or skill building or more practice. We want that conversation to shift to what skill or thinking am I missing? What skill do I need to practice more and demonstrate? What additional evidence do you need to show that I've reached the next level of learning? And again, that word accuracy can summarize our focus this year. We want it to be really clear as we report assessments and learning what's different between a B or a C by focusing on the skills or knowledge, not the number that's attached with those. We want parents and learners both to know these are the specific skills or knowledge areas that you are missing or can beef up to bring up a score or assignment. And we want learners to think about improvements to learning and thinking versus how do I chase a few more points to get to that next level. So everything that we do is connected. Our teaching, our learning, our assessing, our grade reporting, it is all interconnected. All right, so Mr. Dustin, what is learning going to be like for our learners? You're going. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so the, sure, you can do it all. Thank note you very to self, much. animations are not helpful. <laughs> going into the yes. future, so. We tried to be creative here. <laughs> so we are going to see a pattern here, just as we are re-examining how we assess and report grades, we are absolutely re-examining how we teach and how best to support our learners in their learning. What do we want? We want the best for our kids. It's all about them. We strive for learning that is transparent, that they know what is coming up, that there is predictability, that it is visible for the learners to self-monitor, self-track, relevant, real world connections, we're all hearing about our learners, our young people need to have the skills to be competitive in the 21st century. We have to keep up with that. We want learning that is focused on feedback, not just the grade at the end of the term, constant feedback between the learner and the teacher based on individual learner needs, very learner centered. We wanna move away from the other side, the averaging tasks that are weighted, things that are focused on compliance. What I mean is not a crazy classroom that we want necessarily, but compliance meaning you didn't turn in that assignment, you have earned a zero in the grade book for that. And the learner responds, but I understand and I showed you in class that I already understand. Yes, but learner, you didn't turn in the work, you didn't comply, zero. And there we would have some punishment. Also, punitive for absences. We want to get away from that. We want the learners to have all the resources at their hands so that if they are absent, they can continue their learning, continue receiving the feedback from the teacher. We used to all walk, love walking into a class in high school and when the teacher would yell, surprise, pop quiz. Oh my goodness, that we do not want to happen. We want no surprises. We want those learners to be surprised at how good they're feeling about the learning and the progress they're making. Full disclosure, getting away from teacher-centered, more learner-centered. Now, who is executing and creating the environment for all this to happen? Of course, it's our highly skilled teachers, but the focus is on the learner and the learning. One thing that kind of goes along with this, and a lot of times when we discuss grading practices or things like this, and we say, we're, well, we're gonna move away from a zero when you don't turn something in as how we sort of handle that and move on, that might seem like it's corrective, you know, oh, well, if the, if the learner sees they're going to get a zero, they won't do it again. What we actually see is the reality that happens from that is eventually that learner ends up in such a deep hole. Number one, when they've gotten the zero and we say we're done and we've moved on, the learner is no longer responsible for that learning because we've already said, eh, well, you didn't comply in the time frame that we asked you to, zero, move on to the next piece. So that's one piece that the learner moves on and they're no longer held responsible for that learning. The second piece is that that hole becomes so deep over time that in some cases, in many cases, that learner simply gives up. Well, it's the second half of the year. My average is so low. I can't do anything about it now. So what's the point? The third thing is that the teacher in that instance doesn't have the data to support the learner. If all I've done is given a zero and haven't actually measured that learner's progress or held them accountable for that learning, 
Now I'm, I'm at a point where I don't even know where that learner actually knows or does not know. So this is not easier for learners by any stretch. We're saying we want them to be held accountable to their learning, but we wanna do it in a way that is centered on them, centered on feedback, centered on building in that learner sort of need. And I also wanna just pause because I realized we never introduced ourselves. <laughs> We, we just jumped, I just jumped right in. So my name is David Dustin. For those in the digital audience and here, I'm the school principal. And again, very happy to continue working to better support learners and their families. My name is Rachel Sami Leonard. I'm assistant principal here and I work with uh, learner support and, and uh, safety. Hi, my name is Heather Shulman, the other assistant principal and my responsibility is teaching and learning. And my name is Kim Baker and I'm the director of school counseling. Thank you. Sorry about that. I tend to jump in and forget that we should always start with introductions. So back to you. So then what will our grading grade look like? And this is just a review of what we've already been talking about. Go ahead. And that's just a review of everything that we've been talking about. And hopefully you can begin to see the, how the learning and the grading and the teaching is aligning, aligning a bit or it's more learner centered. All right, next slide, please. Let's talk about the actual teaching, the instruction process. It does not happen in a vacuum. And if you look at our, um, the graphic here, the top left blue arrow, our learners have just completed, I mean, our teachers rather have just completed the arduous task of examining all of their standards, statewide, local, national, best practice, and coming with a group of what we call power standards. Around 10 to 12, the most essential learning skills and content knowledge that our community of teachers feels is um, required for our learners at a specific grade level in the specific subject or content area. So we're calling them learning goals. So teacher would identify the learning goal and find out, wow, instead of assigning already or starting to teach, we start with a question. What do my learners already know about this? Again, focusing not on the teacher's needs, but the learner's needs. The learners, what do they need to know? So then we get into our spiral here. And there's the direct instruction by the teacher after he or she has learned what areas of the learning goal the learners need. That's followed by practice with the new skill and the content, and then followed by teacher feedback, more practice where the learners will go back and revise or refine based upon the teacher feedback. Let's keep going with more feedback, more practice, and it just keeps going in a cycle until the learners have a solid understanding of the skills and content, and the teacher is assured that the learners are ready to demonstrate their learning, their understanding in a more formal way. And then we leave that cycle and go on to the summative assessment. And this is a rigorous, high level, real world problem solving activity, or it can be a traditional test where the learners are asked to apply their new learning. And then the grading is on a 1.4 scale, which we'll show you in a minute. Please know that when the learners take the summative assessment, it is not a one and done. It is, let's take a look. We require the learners to self-reflect, identify the areas that perhaps they were not ready. The learners can have some additional practice, additional small group teaching, time with the teacher and then they can take another assessment. So it's all based upon the learners. Here's just another look at it. This was the cycle that our teachers just completed at the end of the school year with their professional development, starting with the, um, the rectangular with the arrow is identifying the learning goals, a lot of research based upon our community, what our learners need, and aligning that with all of the standards. They've identified the skills that our needs, our kids need. Then they've created a one through four progression scale. And the key, the key root of that word is progress. We're looking at progress, supporting the learners in the progress 
toward meeting the target goal of that skill or knowledge. And then the teacher provides instruction, practice, the feedback loop, and that was the previous graphic. And then the summative assessment is assessing the learner's understanding at the learning goal. So a learning goal, this is an example, and we're not gonna read through them all, but for a sixth grade math class, these are the 11 essential skills and areas of content that the math department has determined that our learners need them to be able to move on to grade seven and be successful, to be able to have that content knowledge as they go on from grade through grade through high school and on to continuous learning. These are essential. The one thing I would point out and as well, in addition to the power standards, some people might balk and say, well, there's only 11 things that they're going to learn in sixth grade math. I just want to point two things out with that. One is that a power standard is very complicated and it might say reason about one variable equations, but that word reason implies a lot of additional learning and skill building that has to get to that level. And there's a whole degree of thinking skills that attach with that as well. So that's one piece is each of these, come on in. I am so sorry. We are looking for the gym and we have walked around Anybody know? I'm sorry. It's That's quite all right. Um, yep, Mrs. Somebody will just show you. I feel like we've walked around the building. <laughs> I feel like we definitely should have found it. No, so no problem. No it. apology okay. needed. It's all so, about flexibility. Yes. <laughs> so that's one piece. The second piece is that there are other learning goals that the teams have identified that aren't these essential, you absolutely have to have this foundation to move forward. And those types of learning goals get spiraled into other types of instruction or are learning goals that more advanced learners who might accomplish one of these power standards early might move on to. So I just wanna point that out as well. So if we just look at number one on this list of essential learning goals, power standards, it says, um, understands ratio concepts and uses ratio reasoning to solve problems. Let's take a look and see what that really means. And that would be the next slide. Whoa, this is a list of all of the skills and bits of knowledge learners need within that ratio, ratio reasoning learning target. As Mr. Dustin said, <laughs> each learning goal is very complex when you look at it in a microscopic way. The learning goal is our level three. We are hoping to get our, all of our learners at the level three that they understand and can apply this concept and this skill. There's our one through four. My next slide is going to show you how that translates to the grade. Here we go. I'm sorry, can we just go back for one moment? One thing that Mrs. Shulman has worked tirelessly with the teams to develop, and it's really important because it's useful and helpful for teachers, parents, and learners, is those I can statements that fall within each box. Those are this sort of easy to understand targets that can be almost checked off as learning takes place and, and is assessed. And so we really encourage learners to dig into those with their teachers. And anytime that there's a question, why am I at a two versus a three? those become really concrete and granular pieces that can be identified. You know, well, you aren't at a three yet because one of the skills that you still haven't quite mastered is making a table of equivalent ratios, just as one example. And then that teacher can specifically focus instruction there versus saying, well, you've got a 70 on the test, so do this problem and you're all set. This helps that accuracy piece of being really clear about what skills or specific knowledge pieces have to continue to be worked on. And what about our favorite question we sometimes get from the kids at the end of the term? Can I have some extra credit? <laughs> <laughs> we do not believe in extra credit. What we would say is, just as Mr. Dustin said, go back to the learning goal. Where are areas that you had not yet demonstrated sufficient evidence that you understand? Let's start there. And again, it puts it, in the hands of the learners. It's safe to click now. <laughs> so here is our one through four proficiency scale for grade reporting. And if the learner demonstrates sufficient evidence at the level three, meaning they've met that learning goal, they are deemed quote proficient. 
and the letter grade is a B. Level one would be if a learner just refuses to provide any evidence at all. Okay, you can go ahead. I think this is probably our third slide comparing, <laughs> <laughs> but we just want to be so clear with the difference. And when you look at the fair and accurate grade reporting, you can see why we're so passionate about it, why we're moving that direction. Okay. So how can I see the progress I'm making, my learners are making? Oh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Otis. Next slide. Otis is the learning management system, a web-based platform that the school district approved two years ago, and we've been slowly learning how to use. It is what all the parents, the families, and the learners and the teachers will be using for all of their learning, grading, assessing, communicating, such. It will also be our report card. I highly recommend that everyone visits Otis at otis.com and plays around with their sample, um, the, the sample resources they have there. When school begins, we will then provide learners with their password, give the parents and the community the information about how they can then access their learner's account on this. And the parent can look at any time in real time at the progress their child is making. And if you, we know you can't read this, nor can <laughs> I, <laughs> but this is a sample of a fake person for one class for math. And it lists the many, the many learning goals there. And it gives a description. It gives the date that this was assessed and if you can see the color, the green, the blue, and there's some red, if we scroll down, there's a little bit of red there. That's showing the learner's progress toward demonstrating proficiency. Oh, thank you, wow. Nick. <laughs> so you can see that the fourth goal down there, that that's an area that you can say, all right, let's talk about that. What do you know? What do you not know about this topic? So that when that 77, comes on the report card, well, it won't, but you know what your learner knows and doesn't know. And that tells us as teachers what we need to support, what gaps we need to fill, and what we need to enrich for those who meet the proficiency very quickly. And this sample here, Chandler Bing, who is the student <laughs> at his teacher, Falula, who's teaching math, um, you could, a parent could even click on this and get more information yeah. to see what the assessments were that fed into this current performance level. Ours will not have the same language because we don't use that language that's here exceeds, et cetera. But the parent will be able to click in and get even more information about what is causing that current rating, what the assessments were leading up to that, et cetera. Otis is almost, well, it is, it's like Google Classroom and Web to School mixed. Right now we ask parents to go to Google Classroom Although the access to that for parents is somewhat limited, a lot of feedback we've gotten over the last few years is I can't really tell from these long emails what is missing and what's not. Otis is, is much clearer with that sense. It gives the parents more of a, of a look at what's taking place, but it also contains the grades and the grade book in this one to four format um, at all times for parents to be able to see. So it's really a, a more of a one-stop shop. We'll still have web to school. You can still access that to look at attendance and classes. The quarter grades, like I said, will go in there, although they'll be the same as what's in Otis translated over. But Otis becomes a much better tool for parents and learners as well, because everything is there and more accessible for them. Okay, and this last slide is just an example of some of the resources that Otis has, particularly for parents, families, and community. Um, the, the one link that's there, the long link, is to a, uh, a YouTube video. They have a Facebook page for parents and they're on Twitter and Instagram. 
plus because they're web-based and much younger than I am. They're everywhere on social media. <laughs> Um, so hopefully this will be um, a valuable resource for all. So the last thing we want to kind of capture, this is the summary, I, I suppose, of, of tonight, a sense of what's changing as we come into this school year and continue on to the next phase of being better at, at the fair and accurate grading goal, and also what's staying the same. What's changing is that with the exception of, of the high school science classes, which are remaining very much in the Google Classroom and Web to School realm, all other courses, all other areas will be in Otis, which will essentially, re it will replace Google Classroom in those instances, and will also contain all of the assessments for learning and the one to four scale attached to specific learning goals. That's a big change because again, in the past, if you looked into the Web to School gradebook, the teacher lingo would be in there. It might say test number two, or it might say, you know, sketchbook project on evidence collection. And, and a parent may not always know exactly what that's relating to. Now you have Otis, which has the work and the material from the teacher and the assessment attached to the specific learning goal. So it's much clearer. What's changing is the use of what's called the decaying average as, a, as we continue this transition towards moving away from that. A decaying average uses older assessments with increasingly reduced weight and applies the most weight always to the most recent assessment for those quarter and, and term and um, course grades. This aligns with our philosophy on being accurate with the reporting and making sure that as a learner shows growth, that we're capturing the most recent and most accurate collection of their skill and knowledge when we report grades to families and into the future. The specific learning goals will continue to be, or sorry, will now be assessed and visible to parent guardians on both report cards and in the gradebook, not just what the teachers have input for the assignment name. And I don't know why this is in the changing category because this is not changing. We have, we have had a system of rolling grades for the last four years, which means that the grade always reflects all of the learning goals and assessments. We don't chunk it and say quarter one is this percentage, quarter two is this percentage. That is not changing, that's staying exactly the same. All assessments will continue to be weighted in throughout the course of the year. What is staying the same this upcoming school year? We are going to continue for another year to provide again. This is the stuff on the left is a somewhat large change for many folks. So we don't want to overwhelm the systems and overwhelm people's ability to make those adjustments. So we're leaving for another year the quarter and final grades being translated from the one to four decaying average into a more recognizable zero to 100 scale for the, that, just that quarter and final grade. And we have a, a translation guide that we'll be sending out. We're not going to disrupt transcripts that have already begun to be created. So all learner transcripts for current high school students, that's incoming ninth grade through 12th grade, will continue to show zero to 100 grades into the future. Our goal is to have the current eighth grade group, which is the following year's ninth graders, start with a new transcript that has the one to four grades on there as well. But current CHS learners will continue for their four years of high school with a standard zero to 100 transcript. We will continue to have separated work habits from the academic scores. We will continue to support the retake and reassessment policy that allows for that without penalty. And we will continue to assign zero academic weight to formative or practice types of work. Okay. <laughs> questions should be the last one. There we go. So what are some questions that folks have on these topics or honestly anything else at this point? Just before we uh, start. Before we start, uh, we have a uh, in-person and a remote audience. Um, if you're in person and you want to make a comment, I'm just going to bring a microphone over to you just so that we can capture it for the uh, remote audience recording. And then those who are remote, um, you can either send something via the chat or you can use the hand raise feature at the bottom of your screen. If you use the hand raise feature, we can uh, acknowledge you and then you can make your comment there. Um, so do we want to start with in person? Sure. Okay, if either of you have... <laughs> Not seeing anything in the uh, as far as the injuries, I guess I'm just going to give them a minute or 
this up for the chat and see if we can come through. Sure. While we're waiting for the chat, I would like to reiterate our offer from the last two forums. We would like to meet with people who might have questions, thoughts, concerns. Um, we're happy to do this through a phone call, through an in-person meeting, if that's the case, email exchanges, if that works best for folks. We know that the education of your children as parents and <laughs> your children as parents and is the most important thing for you and it's the most important thing for us. And we're not looking to be opaque, hide things, uh, make things confusing. Our goal is to increase transparency, increase accuracy, increase fairness. So our learners don't become discouraged early in their time in school. And so they can continue to get concrete feedback and skills and reach whatever their post-secondary goals may be. So I'm saying all of that because again, we're very open and would love to meet with anybody who has questions, concerns, thoughts, comments that they weren't comfortable or didn't think of tonight. Um, you can reach us by email, telephone, uh, make an appointment for an in-person meeting. We're happy to do any of those. I guess just as one more point to give people a second um, to potentially make a chat comment. Um, we do have, this is the third forum that we've done. This is uh, Nicholas Handy, by the way, I'm the uh, communications coordinator for the district. So <laughs> also uh, keen on the late introduction. Um, but so on our YouTube channel, uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for uh, SAU 47 broadcast, uh, this is the third forum that we've held. Uh, there's plans for one more, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's gonna be one more forum. Um, they've all been cataloged into a YouTube playlist called JRMS CHS Parent Forums. Uh, the first um, video is called Building Blocks of Success. Second one's uh, just titled Parent Forum, June 3rd, 2022. Um, so if you go to the channel, you can re uh, watch those videos. They both have their own targeted kind of uh, area focused on, you know, grading and some of these other concepts. So feel free to use that as a resource uh, just to uh, have additional, you know, kind of points brought up. And with that being said, I don't have anything on the uh, chat or the hand raise side. So uh, we can give the in-person one more chance to make a comment. <laughs> Is the one to four scale, I guess, modified from how it was last year for math? Because I know we did the transition of one to four specifically mm -hmm. just for math. So I guess I'm wondering if it's the same sort of one to four scale or if from all the review and research and data that's changed. It's the same. So the learning scale itself, the one to four and what that equates to is the same. What the math team has learned over the course of this past year was a couple of things. One is the importance of being concrete with how the assessments are tied with the learning targets. In some cases, especially early in the year, they had to make some adjustments to that as time went on. And the identification of the power standards that Mrs. Shulman was talking about was work that all teams did over the school year. So again, the ability to be more clear and targeted to those big picture, most essential power standards is a big change from what the math team was doing this past year, where they relied more on some of the common core types of standards. And so they had a lot more targets that they were trying to measure. So that would be one big adjustment that I'm aware of um, is the power standards and the targeting that that allows to more concrete and specific assessments of learning. And last year was truly a pilot with our middle level math teachers. Yay for them for taking this on. And we've learned so much from that. And so much so that when we opened up the opportunity for anyone in the school, any teachers to maybe join along, we anticipated maybe one or two groups would, and all but one have embraced the, um, jumped off the ledge and embraced the challenge. Soon the science group will be coming along. They've had so many extra courses, new courses designed, they could not be yet prepared to tackle this at this very moment. Thank you for that question. Good that was question. a great question. Another change, now that I thought of this a little bit more that you'll see this year as well, is that the science team was not using two things. They weren't using Otis for the report card piece. So translating that into web to school proved more problematic than the math team was expecting. Um, web to school, unfortunately, does not have the capacity that we need to, even though we had told it to measure a certain way, it wasn't always doing that. So that created more challenge in Otis for them than they were expecting because they couldn't rely on putting those grades into web to school. And the second piece is the use of the decaying average. That's a decision we made because of the experience this past year 
again, with that fair and, and accurate piece being at the forefront. So this year they did not use the decaying average in the math program and that, that would lead to a change this year. All right, I'm not seeing anything remotely. Okay, well, thank you to the digital audience. Thank you to our in-person audience. We really appreciate it. It saves us from awkwardly just talking to ourselves. So thank you. And again, we'll make this recording and the others available and send them out. And we remain very open and excited for the opportunity to meet with anybody, to chat with anybody, or answer any other questions. Thank you very much.